that's okay. Thank you. How are you doing? Good morning. So this is a fascinating topic for me personally because I recall writing like 18 years or so ago how it was really kind of bad. We were looking at a Microsoft monopoly and it wasn't just a monopoly of Microsoft but of Internet Explorer 6. Uh, so that forecast of mine was not correct. People did notice they went with a better browser. And these days, it seems like we've got a pretty healthy market. We've got Google and Microsoft. Edge is much better than I ever was. Safari leaks memory like crazy, but it's got some nice features. And, and Chrome has taken off ridiculously well. What are these, those big three players and Mozilla with Firefox, what are they all missing that you're going to do better? Well, I think one of the things that's been happening with the browser market, like with a lot of other things, is that you're going for simplification, right? So you, you have browsers that look and feel the same. They're all trying to address the same market. They define the end user that they want to go for, and they take away anything that's different or special. So you end up with something that's quite limited in its approach. And our feel is there is a need for something else. Uh, a, a browser that considers that we are all different. We all have different requirements. I mean, we don't all wear the same clothes. We don't all drive the same cars. We have actually quite strong opinions on these kind of things. And, and I think with a tool that you spend a lot of time with each and every day, actually being able to use it in a more advanced way, being able to do more, is something that matters. And, and that's what we do. We, in, in, instead of saying, OK, let's simplify, remove all the functionality, we say, OK, let's put in a a lot of functionality, but we still make it work easy. And that's, that's a lot harder. It's a lot easier just to, okay, let's just remove everything and make everyone go through a singular tract, and everyone does the same thing. In our case, no, 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 there's a multitude of different ways to do the same thing, and we adapt to you and your requirements how you want to work with the browser. So Vivaldi is a free browser. You're trying to optimize it for privacy as well. You do not charge for it. What's the business model? I mean, the, the business model is actually the same as, as in general for the browsers. Uh, you make revenue from deals that you do, with, like with search engines, for example. So you, you pick and choose search engines that you put in there. Uh, we just added Ecosia as an example. So we have deals with these companies, and then that generates some, some revenue for us. Um, we also, some of the bookmarks that we include generate revenues. So it's a, it's a fairly known known way, and it, it, it's a great way because we only focus on providing the best possible product for the end user. We then try to choose the partners that our users would like, but still give them the flexibility to do whatever they like. So the revenue, I mean, we're, we're talking a revenue at Opera, we're talking about a dollar per user per year. So it's not a lot of money, but as long as you get enough users, it Make all it works. up on volume. Yes. Okay. So another interesting thing that's changed a lot in the browser market since the bad old days of 2001 or so is how much of this is all open source code. Your browser uses the Blink rendering engine of Chrome. Uh, a lot of the UI itself, I understand, is built out of open source web code. Um, how much has that eased your job and that of anybody trying to break into the browser market? Well, I think, I mean, uh, having build one of the few codes that was available, the Opera code, I know how much work it is. And there's a reason why none of the companies that have, I mean, there's been no new browsers coming from scratch for almost 20 years. If you try to think about it, that means that Safari was built on the KHML code. Yes. And Chrome was built on the Safari code. And we follow in that same way, and we are building then off the Chromium code base. So, Given that it wasn't possible for Apple or Google to start from scratch, you can safely assume, even though we've done this before, that we also recognize it would take us a lot of time to do so. So realistically, starting from scratch, it would be impossible. So instead, what we do, we focus on the user interface part of it. And we've actually done things in quite an interesting and different way. Um, the whole user interface is actually a web page. So it's... Uh, the browser is written using the browser, which means that we can develop really quickly. We can debug very easily. Uh, there's no huge compiles necessary most of the time. And it allows us to, to take input from end users and actually do something about it inside sometimes as little as minutes, which okay. is a fantastic feeling. 
Yeah, the, the interesting, the feature that really caught my eye was, I guess, all the analytics you give the user about their own history, which yep. I guess advertisers were always seeing that, but in this case, you, the user, can see how much time you waste at Apple rumor sites or whatever it may be. Yeah, I mean, uh, clearly, there's a lot of information about all of us. At the same time, we don't have access to that information. So what we did, we, okay, we have all this browsing data on your computer, why not use that for your use? So we're not putting this out there. This is, this is for your eyes only. And we are actually just presenting the data that is there. But it gives you a lot of information. It helps you find, OK, I was browsing on these and these pages that day, and I found this interesting article. And you can use the context of what you were looking for. And you can, it can help you find your way in, in, in history. And this is one of the, I mean, we take every part of the browser and we say, okay, let's, what can we do to make this a lot more useful? Uh, the second thing, as you mentioned, is the statistics that you can see, okay, this is how much I'm browsing. And if you want to see how much time you spend on Facebook or Twitter or the like. No, we don't. <laughs> we don't want to know that. Well, <laughs> you can. And, and if you don't, you don't have to, but it's, but it's, it's, it's all there. You can see, you can also see at the, uh, might be useful for some people to see at what time of the day you're using it. If it's a lot of it at 3 a.m., that might be something. Yeah, that, I, I wouldn't know anything about that. <laughs> uh, so uh, where do users break down in terms of Mac, Windows, Linux? Um, overall, I guess, in relation to the platform sizes, the odd one out is Linux. So our Linux user group is massively bigger than Linux in general. So we have a lot of support on Linux, which, which is fantastic. We, we, a lot of us are Linux fans at the company, so it's, it's a lot of fun to be working with the Linux community. Okay, good. Um, site compatibility can be a big deal with browsers. Um, extensions as well. It was interesting to see that you all implemented support for Chrome extensions not long ago. Uh, was that something where it wasn't originally part of the plan, and then your users said, like, look, I can't live without my Evernote Web Clipper, or whatever their favorite extension is. No, actually, it was part of the plan from okay. the very beginning. I mean, it, we uh, obviously we have the benefit that we're running on the Chromium code base, so being able to be compatible with uh, the plugins available, the extensions available, uh, it's, it's maybe not as difficult as all that, except it is, because we decided to do the web UI thing. Yeah. So actually, we had to do all the hooks and all the work, and, and it took a lot of time to get it working. So the guys have done a tremendous job to make that. It's one of the hardest things for us to actually get working was the extension because of our decision to do the browser web-based. Now, the benefit of doing the web browser web-based is clearly a lot faster development, and also that we have cross-platform development. We have Windows, Mac, and Linux being available at the same time. They look and feel the same, although we do address the differences between the platforms and adapt to the platform requirements and looks and feel and that, that like. But we do it on, on the website, and so it's a lot. Um, we, we save a lot of time by doing this, and, and it allows us to work in a very dynamic way. Uh, we choose for any task that we need to do, what's the best tool to fix this? Do we do it with C++? Do we do it with JavaScript, HTML, and the like? About how much time do you spend making sure that you know, site X, Y, or Z looks and works right in the browser? I mean, theoretically, that should be solved for you using the Chrome, Chromium code base, but we know things get complicated. Well, I mean, given that we're using the Chromium code base, uh, basically all sites work out of the box. So the issue for us is browser sniffing. So if some site um, recognizes that it's Vivaldi. They explicitly look for the word Vivaldi in, in the text, and they do something silly. Uh, that's we, gotta be fun. Yeah, and interestingly, I mean, it's companies like Google that do that. How rude. <laughs> but, um, so we have had to, we, we have a list of sites where we uh, hide ourselves. And that's the, the thing that we have to spend time on. Most all other cases, we don't really have to do anything. I mean, it, it, again, it's, it's Chromium. It's the most used code base out there. So we don't have to do anything. That the sites just work. Well, if there are bugs in, in our code, obviously, we fix them fairly quickly. But yeah. Uh, so we talked about the desktop. You all do not have a mobile browser. How is that? Um, I mean, uh, it, it's just been taking time. We, we started on Android at the same time as we started with desktop. 
And then we found that uh, our solution for doing uh, the desktop browser, um, including uh, solutions for the extensions and the like, did not really lend itself well to the mobile browser. So from that perspective, it actually delayed our progress a little bit, but the mobile browser is in the works and, and, and it will be, will be coming out there. It just takes a little bit of time. Will, will that be for Android and iOS or just Android? Uh, initially Android. Um, the issue with iOS is that we cannot use the same code base. Uh, right. You have to use WebKit. Yes. And that means there's a lot more extra work for us. So it's, it's, a, it's a question of... Obviously, we're just hoping Apple does the right thing and, and, and stops not allowing other browser cores to run on their platform. Uh, good luck with that. <laughs> well, I mean, sometimes things happen. I mean, it, yeah. it's the right thing to do, right? It's the right thing to do, and, and, and sometimes companies, they learn from their mistakes and, and then they yeah. change. So I'm, I'm hoping that they will do that. Um, but if they don't, then it, they're making our task of providing our, our browser on the platform a lot diff more difficult. Yeah, and I guess you would probably still want to have, have the user be able to designate a non-Apple default browser in iOS. Yes. Which is also something you can't do right now. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. I, I really, I've always had this view that when you have guests, you don't lock the door, you don't throw away the key. Inside, you entice them. If you want them to stay, give them something good to eat, something good to drink, uh, put on some good music, or do something that they will be happy visiting you, don't lock them in. That's, that's just the wrong way. So that's, I guess, one threat to a vibrant browser market. What other worries keep you up at night? Um, I mean, in the browser market, okay, sense, so you're not, not like President Trump or anything <laughs> else. <laughs> well, I mean, actually, I, I am obviously thinking about a lo lot of uh, how, do, how does our world play into all of this, right? How does the, the world of browsers and the internet play into the discussions on politics and uh, how was the internet used to uh, distribute false news and the like? I mean, that's quite interesting, and, and I believe that there is something we could do there. I, I, I think uh, significantly more focus on privacy uh, instead of uh, opening up uh, for more companies to get into our data and, and, and make profiles on us, actually make it harder by not allowing to collect the same amounts of data and, and actually say how you're able to use them. I think if you did that, that would be a very important factor in, in um, making it harder to target us in the kind of ways that we're doing. So this is a question of privacy, and I think there are things that go hand in hand. Maybe we'll see less intrusive ads, at the same time we'll see less targeted fake news. Oh, that would be nice. Um, let me ask you a sort of the dreaded two-part question. One is, what is your forecast for the browser market two years from now? Um, I mean, in some ways, I, I believe things will continue to evolve. I mean, obviously, we are going to be at the head front of, of, on, on, on coming up with new technologies and, and new innovations. And I, I don't want to tell you everything about, because partly, uh, I don't know. <laughs> because we, the way we work, we work as a team. Anyone can have an idea and some things will happen. But on the other hand, if you're thinking about the overall direction, I think the Internet of Things and, and connecting things is something that uh, at Opera we worked on from 2005 with, uh, uh, with uh, the alien project that it originally was called in, uh, internally uh, with the concept of having uh, two-way communication. So I think that's something that we haven't come very far with. And I think the Internet of Things is a mess because you have a lot of incom incompatible solutions. So I think there's going to be happening things there. I think it's been moving extremely slowly because of the closed systems. But I think um, over time, people will see the light, and, and we'll see an open system, and we'll see a lot of innovation coming through that. So getting the different devices connected, uh, and, and connected in a way where they're actually working together instead of you having to have one app per device, which kind of makes everything very, very, very difficult. Yes. So yes. You, it, it, it's, it's related to browser from the perspective that I believe that all those things need to be based on web technologies, trying to uh, actually agree on any other standard, it, we've seen that. That doesn't work. You invent your standard, you try to get other people to support it, and they say, why should we support your standard? We, I mean, you should support mine. But the only way you can avoid that is say, okay, let's just use this common standard where the basics are all in place, and then we just work on, on, on moving that forward. Yeah, and so far the most common standard is, I guess, an Amazon Echo ordering around the rest of your devices. 
Yeah, and the thing with that is that, okay, you do the Amazon Echo, and then Google has their thing, and Apple has their thing, and then Samsung has their thing, and you have a number of others, and they, they don't work together. What you would like to see and is, is that any third-party developer should be able to connect all these devices together, so when you come home, uh, you can have things happen automatically, that your car is talking to your stove or, or informing some, I mean, anything that you'd like it to program. I mean, at home, I have a lighting system that's controlled. I have a jacuzzi that's controlled, and I have various other devices. If I wanted to, for example, on my way home, turn on the lights and the jacuzzi, I couldn't do that. So that's I mean, a multiple app step? Yes. Okay. Which, uh, yes, there are ways to do that, but I really think it should be standardized, and you should define APIs for all of this, and this is where there's only a one natural place for this, which is the W3C. And the second part of that question, two years ago you must have had some well-defined senses of what the browser market was going to look like in 2017. How has reality diverged from your forecast? I think overall it's been quite similar to what I... I mean, it, my feeling is when you're inside the bubble, you feel that everything is working in a glacial pace. I mean, everything is so slow. Uh, so we are just doing our thing, and we feel obviously that what we are doing is moving very quickly, but we would like to see that there's more things happening. I, I mean, there are some interesting technologies coming out, but, but overall, I mean, I would like to see things move a lot faster, a lot more technology happen, and, and at the same time, obviously, keeping in mind that we need to think about the ethics and the morals and our place in society and, and, and how we ensure uh, keeping our users safe overall. From, from malware and... Well, uh, from Valve, but also, I mean, I, I, again, I mean, we've been seeing how the internet is, is being played, and I get a little bit pissed off about that, how the internet is being used uh, to reach people in malicious ways, and obviously thinking about how we can stop that, and actually, uh, in, in some ways, I think some of those things are fairly obvious, the privacy thing, I think it's extremely important. Um, and, and I think those things are things we should talk about as well, but it's more difficult to do it purely in the software in the, in the browser, but it's, it's better if you do it on a more global scale. I think someone once told me the only problem with the internet is the human beings on it. Well, I mean, with any tool, you can use your tools for good and for bad. And, and the nice thing about the internet is the big equalizer, and, and we've seen how voices can be heard through the masses, voices that should be heard, and that's a fantastic thing. The same tools, however, are being used to uh, undermine uh, the society. And that's a sad thing that you're seeing something as powerful. I mean, we're seeing free speech being used to undermine free speech. It's, it's kind of a weird situation that we're having. Uh, but it, when it comes to the internet, this is something that we've been working on for all these years. And being, seeing it misused, it's obviously something that we need to take seriously and we have to fight for keeping the internet open and free. Uh, that all the information out there continues to be available to all people, that we don't get silos, that we don't have different speeds, all those things that we're having a discussion on. I mean, we worked so hard to get the internet to where it is today, and we have to continue working on it, uh, continuing to get it evolved, uh, and, and provide new technologies and new ways that uh, move humanity forward. That's a good place to end it. Thank you, sir. Cheers.